Okay, looks like we are live uh, <laughs> from the porch. We'll see how this works out. Welcome. Uh, I am Daniel Norton, if you don't know already. Uh, I see some, we got some people already in the chat. Welcome. Hey, uh, Rick, Dennis, Kenneth, uh, and all the other. Oh, from Germany. That Lothar and Rob. And looks like a Zachary from earlier. And Soul Beast. So, yeah, uh, let me know how my sound and stuff is, guys, because I'm using a left. <laughs> when I set this up, I was like, oh, I'll do a live stream. And then I realized, I don't think I've live streamed from my porch before. So we're going a little different setup here. I've got my uh, Z62 uh, on, the, on a tripod in front of me with 24 to 70. I've got an HDMI cable running into a cam link. Uh, the Nikon does have their own little software to put the Z in series cameras, not some of them, if not all of them, um, into the directly in OBS, which is what I'm using. But uh, yeah, it's not full resolution and you don't get sound transfer. So uh Hopefully uh, we're getting good sound here. So I have the I have a lav plugged into the Nikon. So that's why I didn't do it that way. Uh, you can though. You can do it with one cable, but then you need separate sound, which I didn't want to deal with. So everything's in the Z6 two, which means that if anything happens and the battery dies or something, which it shouldn't, because I have it plugged in, uh, then you'll lose all of everything, <laughs> everything at once. So, anyways, welcome guys. Happy Friday. Uh, I've been doing, as you probably know if you watch the channel, uh, my short videos on Fridays. Obviously, I pre-record those. So I thought it would be fun before this holiday weekend here in the U.S. I thought that it would be fun to do a little live stream, talk to you guys, get some more uh, feedback on what you guys like here on the channel, what you want different, change. It's the summer, you know. So we're moving on. I see that Zachary, I think it was at the very beginning, had a good question about lighting for interior environmental portraits. I'll talk about that in a second, that I like that. Um, so, uh, Rob... Well, I get the ZFC. That's that new fancy looking small one, I think, right? Um, maybe. Uh, you know, I had thought about currently my setup. I leave, You know, I have a studio in Manhattan, obviously. If you watch my other videos, you see that I work there. I leave most of my gear there. Uh, but I've got a Z6 II that I kind of is my carry around camera. And I use that for streaming uh, here at home now. During the summer, last year, I was using the Z50 for streaming. Uh, for various reasons, because it was small and stuff. So I just have one camera at home right now, which is a Z6 II. I use it for streaming, like I'm doing now. But also, if I need to run out and take a photo, somebody calls me for a portrait or something, I have this and a couple of lights here. So I don't know if I'd switch to that, because if I was to buy it at all, I'd get it only for streaming. So it would just basically be, uh, I don't know how much it's going to cost, a $700, $600 streaming camera? Maybe. It looks pretty cool, though. I do like that it's USB-powered. So, you know, over the Z50, I probably would prefer it, but I don't know that I need... Uh, although... The cool retro look is always fun. England, hey, sound is good. I'm glad I checked this. Before. Glad I talked for 10 minutes before I checked to see if the sound was good. <clears throat> oh, there's a van backing up. Oh, I think these are people delivering my pants. I ordered some jeans. I think they are, actually. Yep, it's, it's, the, it's the guy who's delivering them. This is very exciting. We're live and we're getting a live delivery. Oh. Yeah. Oh, she's going to put it in my mouth. Oh, there she is. Oh, careful. Oh. Yeah, so she's going to... Uh, do I need to sign for that? Oh, she's not listening to me. She has headphones in. So I didn't want to make her come all the way up the stairs. There's a lot of stairs in my house. She's probably just going to throw it up here. Let's see what happens. This is very exciting. Oh, there she is. Oh, okay. Yep, she's just scanning it. <laughs> I ordered new jeans from American Eagle. That's the way it is now, right? We want things, we just order them online, they show up at our house. So, luckily I knew which ones I needed because I looked inside. And I haven't got too much fatter, so I just ordered the same size. <laughs> that was completely random and not about photography at all. Uh, okay, Canada. The video is flipped. Oh no, the video is not flipped. <laughs> the shirt is backwards because uh, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're supposed to read it to yourself. So the video is not flipped. <laughs> That's very funny though. Um, Toronto, your sound is fine. Picture is fine. Lips are synced. Yes. Um, cool. All right. Yeah, Z62 is, is a beast. Huh. Do vlogs? Oh, coming back to doing it every day? <laughs> I could do that. Uh, it's all the France. Welcome. So, yeah, guys. Uh, I don't know if I can go back to doing it every day. Um, the sound is faded. Really? I might just be talking softer. Um, let me see if I'm talking softer. If you're losing the sound, guys, let me know. There's like a... Um, 
noise suppression because I know that there's I have the air conditioner running and stuff, so I may have to kill that. But uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's really cool, totally sidetracked here, that you can do this. I mean, I'm, I'm literally, you know, we've got people from, from various parts of the world. Portugal, yeah. And, uh, you know, here I am with a Nikon sitting on my front porch and a little laptop. This is the first time I've done it like this. Um, I've got the new MacBook Air. I don't know if it's new. The M1 Mac MacBook Air, which is so nice. It's so tiny. Um, so I have that out here. I've never streamed from it before, so we'll see what happens there. Um, <clears throat> okay, sound is fine. Okay, so I'm just going to... If you guys have things you want to talk about besides just general stuff, then go ahead and throw it in the chat. Um, this is a good question, though, from, from Zachary Phillips. Uh, how to go about lighting for indoor environmental portraits. So that, that's a really good question. So when you're doing any kind of a, an environmental shot, a portrait, whether you be outside or inside, what you really want to, <laughs> this is gonna sound super obvious maybe, but maybe not, you really wanna think about the, the environment, right? Uh, the most simple way to do it, and I used to work for this um, publication, it was for an HMO when I was living in Florida, and we would have to shoot uh, doctors and we would shoot them in like in their offices or in their facility. And because we didn't have a lot of time and it was more of kind of photojournalistic style, what we would usually do in those situations is look for kind of a nice background that had a decent amount of light on it, put the put the doctor themselves kind of in a place that was darker than that. So like, let's say if there was windows lighting the hallway, you would move them kind of out of the window so they were dark, basically. And then you could light them with the softbox or something so they looked really nice and lit, but the hallway looked correct, right? So that's a matter of mixing the ambient light with, uh, with, the, um, with the flash, right? But if you're in full control, and especially if you're shooting somebody that's like, uh, has something interesting going on, like you go to an artist's studio or you go to, let's say, a musician and you go to like a little recording studio they have in their house or they're an author and you're going to shoot them in their, their their little office that has like, you know, a typewriter or whatever they write on. Um, you know, this is what we want to think about uh, kind of the things we do in the studio. We want to consider uh, taking control of the space as best as possible, maybe even eliminating the light from any windows that are there, assuming you have time to set it up. And you want to light the subject in the background separately, but in a way that they they fit together, right? So what I mean by that is you don't want to just throw a big light up and have it light the subject and the background because that generally looks flat and boring. But you also don't want to light the background in such a way that it um, that it looks like it's a cutout, the person standing there. So I usually kind of let, let some of the light bleed in. So for instance, let's say I'm lighting a musician in, in a, like a little space where they record and there's like some guitars hanging on the wall or something. If I throw, let's say, some, some cool blue gel on the back wall on the guitars, and then I knock them slightly out of focus with a, you know, a more open aperture, what I'll do is from like my kicker light on the subject in front, I'll put a slight blue gel on there. So it feels like this blue light that's behind them is coming through forward on the scene and lighting them too. So you just want to be thinking about you know, that the background should be lit separately, but that you need some kind of factor, ideally, that will tie the person into the background so it won't look so completely out of place and they won't just look like a cutout. You know, unless you're going for that, obviously. Uh, so that's my advice there. And, you know, just to, if you can uh, avoid getting ambient light in the space, that's what you should do. You know, one of the things that we used to we used to work for this publication and we would go in and treat a lot of people in like offices. So so it would all we'd always, you know, never, you know, people are working in the office. So you'd have to be like, OK, well, we're going to turn off lights here and you would kind of plan around it. And then at the last minute, you turn the lights off in the space and, you know, some workers would pop up out of their cubicles looking around. But, you know, you want to try to eliminate as much of that ugly light as possible and light as best as you can. So that's that's how I would handle environmental stuff. Uh, take control of your space, light the background separately than the subject, but have some kind of light or characteristic that ties the subject back into the background. Okay. Uh, you can hear all the cars by. Goodbye. <laughs> You're definitely going to hear that. Ohio. Nice. Yeah, I like this little guy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the, the software is not caught up, which is why I'm not using it as my main computer. Uh, but I have... Uh, I've used it with uh, Capture One, uh, with... Uh, obviously web browsing and now now OBS and I've used it with uh, with Photoshop a little bit and it seems to be working fine you know whether or not I don't do speed tests it's just I'm not that technical but it seems pretty good I mean I don't think it I, I watched a lot of videos when when the M1 first came out and people were like this thousand dollar although I got the more ramps so not thousand dollar one but this is better than the five thousand dollar it's not better than my expensive MacBook that I've, I've had for three years but it was also like fifteen hundred dollars so you know it is what it is and it's tiny. 
do you have for every shoot a model release? <clears throat> That's a good question. That type of thing, you depending on where you are in the world, I think that you are from Germany, is that correct? It, it, there's different laws um, about whether you need them or not. Uh, I would recommend getting them if you are doing something that could be potentially commercial. And I definitely recommend being upfront with the person about what it is and that there is a potential to use it commercially. You know, if somebody goes to your studio or whatever, you know, and poses for, for a set of photos and you put it into your portfolio and then later on, and you didn't get a model release and later on they say, Oh, you know, I didn't, you didn't, I didn't say that was okay. I mean, what did they think? You know? Uh, so I feel like that if you're working with people that, you know, it's not always an issue, but you know, if you don't know somebody and especially if you might sell it or use it commercially, I would get a release, just a real basic one. You know, I also recommend paying somebody at least minimally, if you think that's the case, just something, you know, that way, at least they feel like they got something for it. Now, if you paid them $50 for whatever, for the day of shooting, just to give them transportation money, and then you go and sell it to some advertising company for $10,000. Even if it's not in your release, I think I would probably go back and compensate the person more just because that seems like the right thing to do, though you're not required to. Um, I just think there's a lot of horror stories and it comes from that where photographers aren't honest with people and they're shooting like stock photography and the person just thinks they're doing like a test shoot or something and they sign this release and the next thing you know, they're in some advertisement. So at least you have that safe uh, area where the person can't say, oh, I didn't want to be in that ad, you know. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> Puerto Rico, oh man. Hold on, what? Oh, wait, we can ask anything? <laughs> sure, go for it. I might not answer it. Uh, <laughs> let's see, go for it. Uh, what are you streaming with that? The shirt's backwards. The shirt's not... <laughs> I probably wore a bad shirt for this stream. The shirt is not... It's, it's backwards so that when I look in a mirror, it, I can read it. It's giving me advice on what I should do. So it's actually not backwards. I probably could flip it for you guys, but then it would be weird because look... I mean, the shirt's backwards, the stream's not. That's right. Appreciate my Gary Khan mug. I gave you a second to read it, you know, because that's getting old. Nova Scotia. Nice. I have some, like, cousins in Nova Scotia, so go visit them and say, I just said, uh, uh, use Mario's sparingly, and then got burns, and now I always use them. Yeah, I just think it's a, you know, people are hesitant to sign stuff, so just be honest and upfront with it. And certainly don't throw it at them at the end of the shoot. Tell them up front they got to sign it. Um, although I have heard, and I do not know this is true because I'm not a lawyer, that it, if you have them sign the model release before the shoot, then it's not legal. They have to sign it after the shoot, which seems weird to me. But I do know that in commercial shoots, they always sign it at the end. So if that makes any sense. Uh, if it over 50... Oh man, I'm below 50 and I'm not fit. What's the widest angle full frame for a large group shot before everything looks distorted? 35 millimeters? That depends on how close you stand and the lens. There, Canon makes a, an amazing, because uh, I'm shooting Nikon now, an amazing 14 millimeter uh, rectilinear lens that it basically is, it doesn't get distorted at all unless you get, unless you hit a weird angle, as long as it's level. So you could use that, you know. Um, but if you start getting close to people, that's when you start getting pull out. So if you're shooting a group, you're usually far, far enough back. I usually shoot groups with like a, a 21, you know, you know, and when you say group, I'm assuming like a bunch of people, 12 people, 15 people. Otherwise I shoot it with a 24, but 35 is, is fine as well. I just feel like 35 for, unless it's a really small group is going to end up being kind of, you have to wait, go way far away. Uh, fine. niche photography and dating portraits. Oh my God. They just want natural light so it doesn't look like any actual shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really interesting. So <laughs> I may have said this before in a video. The very first gig I ever did in New York City, I mean, once I moved to New York City, I had worked in New York before, was actually for a, a dating portrait. And I photographed this guy. He was, uh, up, it was on the Upper West Side. Really beautiful area. We went over to Central Park and we did these photos. And uh, he was, you know, like me, probably worse than me, the balding. And, uh, you know, I sent him the pictures and he was like, oh, uh, can you put hair on top of my head? I said, I can, but I'm not going to. 
uh, so I didn't do it. But I did give him permission to have it retouched by somebody else because, you know. But anyways, to answer your question, uh, I would think if you're trying to shoot something for a uh, any kind of date, dating site, I mean, I'm assuming like a, just a generic dating site, typically I'll give you the advertising uh, rules, right? Bright and airy and warm, right? That's how you want them to look. So a really bright background, like don't put them against a super dark background, don't put them against the wall, get kind of some distance, have some brightness behind them, not white, but like bright, uh, you know, that's a good place to do the thing where you stick them under some shade, you know, or hold a silk over top of their head so that the background goes a bit blown out. Make sure that your white balance is a little bit on the whiter, so warmer side, generally speaking. I mean, it depends on the skin tone. And uh, that'll give you kind of a nice natural light shot that'll look professional, but doesn't look necessarily like it couldn't be shot by somebody um, that wasn't, like it was just shot by a good photographer, I guess. But that's really good, though. Uh, I mean, people always need pictures for dating sites, right? Uh, more about using a light behind from above, pointed down to highlight the head and shoulders. I've seen others do it with a strip box. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, that is a good way to do it. The reason why people like to do, I mean, okay, so that whole like above light thing was very popular uh, at one point and people would uh, start off using like a grid. So it would just like light the head and it would look kind of unnatural, right? Because, the, <laughs> you know, it hit the shoulders too, but the, 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 the main part would hit the top of the head and you'd have this bright head and the shoulders would fall off. So a lot of people started resorting to strip banks because it makes it a little e more even. And you can kind of feather the light so that it's basically aimed at the shoulders so that only the edge of the light is really touching the top of the head because, of course, the top of the head's closer to the light than the shoulders. And then that will help you balance out the exposure so it's not like right on top of their head. But usually you put it like about a foot or so behind them and then kind of tilt it down so that it's kind of just hitting the shoulders and the... It's not a bad technique. Strip bank's good for that. Uh, probably not a grid on it. You probably want to leave it as open. Greetings from Netherlands. Hey. Uh, let's see. No matter how old I get, I'll always be younger than that's the damn that's that is the uh, damn sure truth. Uh, do you have any other method on lighting large groups? Uh, so little on the web. Well, I think there's so little on the web for lighting large groups because it's usually kind of boring, you know? I mean, unless you're doing something very, very specific, like a drum line and you're going to light every person independently because you have this advertising job for, or it's, or it's like a editorial job for Sports Illustrated or something. If you're just shooting a bunch of people, the best thing to do is just use as large a light source as possible and back it up so that everybody's even because you don't want shadows to fall on people behind and you don't want, uh, you know, uh, the light to fall off. So backing it up is going to increase the depth of the light using, you know, inverse square and big is going to keep it soft. So you don't really see any shadows. It'll just keep it flat. So usually trying not to be do anything too fancy with large groups is why probably people don't have to do videos because it's pretty easy. My go-to for that is usually big umbrellas. You could also use silks. I don't necessarily recommend soft boxes unless that's all you got because soft boxes are designed to control the light spread and we want to open it up. So yeah, that's what I would do with large groups. Actually, if you search around for it, there's a great, although Joe did it more funky, but there's a great video where Joe McNally uh, photographs uh, an entire fire, uh, I don't know if they're called departments in New York City, but they're called fire station, maybe it's what it's called. So there's a bunch of people in it, like maybe 12, 15 people. And he does it like on the street. It's a pretty good video. Just search Joe McNally group fire department or something, you'll find it. Um, so most difficult client you've worked, share your experiences. Uh, difficult in what way? I mean, like difficult, like they ask too much. If you are, I think I said this in the video, if you, I mean, early on you make this mistake a lot, but if you are um, doing your legwork up front, hopefully clients won't be difficult. But I have had a couple of horror stories. Um, I find things to be difficult when it's either emotionally taxing because you're photographing something that's very close to you, um, or if you're really under pressure for time. That's when I consider it difficult and because I think that when you're, uh, especially the time part, because you always feel like you can do a better job. So if you are in a situation where you have to do something um, really quickly, um, it can sometimes be very stressful because you know you could do a better job if you just had this thing, but you can't go get the things, you don't have time. So you really end up with, oh, there's a mosquito out here. Uh, you know, you may not get exactly the shot you want, even if you get the shot you, you need. So, uh, you know. I don't want to make it seem like a no shot's difficult, but I feel like the shots that are more that I'm more involved in, like if it's sensitive material, you know, something with to do with like somebody dying or, you know, uh, I did this series of, of shoots that I photographed uh, these children who had um, 
a terminal illness or, you know, that they were born with. And that was very difficult, you know, uh, because you, you knew that these people, you know, this, this, this photo that you were doing for the family was going to be their one professional photo probably of that child. So, you know, those were hard, but they weren't hard because they were, um, in fact, they were super fun because the kids were all amazing. But anyways, that's all. Um, yeah, I find that stuff more difficult. Technical, if I know I'm going into a technical shop, then I'll plan. So I usually don't find that uh, hard um, in that sense, you know. Uh, okay, where should we get? Uh, okay. Hmm, model shoots. Agency always has had a rep sign the model's behalf before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Before, huh? Hmm. That's interesting. Typically when... Um, it, model releases is interesting, actually, since you mentioned modeling agencies. Right. If you're dealing with an agency and you're doing, like, a commercial job, usually what the model will bring you is, a like, a form from the agency that lists that they worked, and you sign that. They don't sign anything. You sign this form because, again, right, like they're saying, the modeling agency takes care of the, the contracting. You know, so the form is just, like, something that you... Um, God... The name will come to me in a second. They call it something very specific. It's like a, it's not a call sheet. It's like a, if somebody even knows the name, but basically the model brings it. It's from the agency. It has the job on it and you sign off that they showed up and did the job. So you're signing that they did the work and then there's a contract. That's a different thing than a model release. I mean, a model release is a contract, but a different kind of thing. Uh, things time look pretty fit. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I only show the better part of me. <laughs> Uh, a hard one can throw a punch. <laughs> yes, that, you know, hopefully that doesn't become a, a relative factor, but, you know. Uh, hey, Daniel, uh, what are your thoughts on shooting film in addition to digital? Oh, man. So here's my, <laughs> my thoughts on that. I, I used to do quite a bit of that, but I found that me personally, because of the way my brain works, I find it more difficult, and this is the reason why, because I will do a photo shoot and shoot a bunch of digital and then shoot film and then I'll have the digital shots and I will look at them and I'll edit them and I'll send them to the model and we'll be happy and then a few weeks later the film will come back with the scans and I'll be like okay I already have these photos so for me because just because of the way my brain works it's hard for me to do like that it, back in the day when I used to have my stuff processed locally it was different because a lot of times I would actually have the film first because I'd drop it off the lab and they'd have it in like two hours where I wouldn't have even have gone through the, the digital shit. So these days I usually shoot film to shoot film and not as part of another project. But that's just because of my kind of my mental thought process. Uh, what coffee? Oh, man. I'm drinking Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I know it's terrible. Um, I'm also from Massachusetts, so that's I blame that. Oh, man. So what kind of laptop would I recommend for shooting tethered? I absolutely know, I know absolutely nothing about PCs. So if you were asking me, I would say a Mac because that's what I know. So I don't know if that's a fair, fair assessment. Um, depending on if you're just using your machine to tether or to tether and edit, it's a big difference. You know, you don't need that much power typically to, to just tether. Um, but if you also want to be able to do other things, then I would go for a more robust computer with more RAM. I actually go to a computer guy that tells me what to buy. Cause, but I try to buy the best thing I can. I mean, PCs are, are, are great. I mean, I don't use them, so I have no idea like even what kind you'd use. But, um, you know, you don't need the greatest thing. This Mac M1 uh, is, uh, is fine for tethering with this camera. I've not tethered a 100 megapixel camera with it, so... I can't say, excuse me, I would probably make sure that you've got USB-C uh, or 3 or whatever, the, the fastest USB you can get um, these days. Other than that, okay. Am I going to pull out a video or invo on invoices estimates? I might. Right, exactly. I'm, I'm probing, right? Uh, right, <laughs> working with Tano's difficult in general. That is true. I am a total and complete prima donna. <laughs> uh, did I get to try the ZFC or no, only Seth did, I think. Nope, he kept them to himself. That's how he is. Um, control background spill when using a softbox for a headshot to a three-quarter shot, but I struggle lighting background separately 
or trying to light full length, any device. Well, right, that is not uncommon, right? <laughs> the way that you control spill is by keeping the light source as close as possible to the subject. You, because in the background is far away, obviously. The reason why is because we're using the inverse square law, right? So if I put the softbox real close to me, then it the by the time it hits the background, it's so far away proportionately that I'm brighter. So uh, I'm assuming you get that because you said the other part is putting it out there for anybody who might not understand. So if I'm lighting this much of me, I can use a small softbox, right? Light my face. It'll still be soft relatively. The background will go dark because I can keep it real close. If I'm lighting a three quarter, I can use a two foot by three foot softbox and keep it real close to me and cover as much of my body as possible. And because it's so close, the background will go dark. If you wanted to shoot a full length shot and have that same uh, control, you need a bigger box. Now, if you don't want to buy a six foot softbox, because a lot of people don't want to deal with that, what you could do, and what I've done in many times, is stack two small boxes. So you take like two, you get your standard soft boxes that are like two foot by three foot, and you basically put them, you know, one on top of the other. So you create a soft box that is two foot by six foot. You have to use two heads, obviously, to do this. You put them, you know, line them up, and you can put them real close to the subject. As long as they're not over six feet, you can put them almost next to them, right? And you can even put grids on them if you really need to control the spill. And that will give you that big soft light for a full length shot without the problem with the spill issue because you don't have to back the light up to get the coverage. So that's the trick. Um, or just buy a very big soft box if you, you know, do it enough and it justifies it. Uh, let's see. Uh, have you ever a feeling of this government fear take, uh, of taking this up and knowing your friends in the profession already and scared to open? Oh, so you're saying like somebody, you have friends that are in the profession and you feel like you're, you're, you're kind of coming into it and you feel like you're going to take their jobs or they'll be, you'll be in competition with them? No, I mean, <laughs> I have no friends. No, I think that a, a, a world... I say it. It's not. It's easy to say. You're only in competition with yourself. I mean, yeah, you're going to have friends that bid on the same jobs as you and stuff. As long as you're all professional and you can separate business from friendship, then it shouldn't really be a problem. And hopefully, they're not scummy and try to steal your jobs, and you're not scummy and try to steal their jobs. But when I was first starting, especially because a lot of my friends were photographers, because we all started as photo assistants, a lot of times we were bidding on the same jobs. And sometimes, in fact, more often than not, one of us would get it and the other ones would assist because we wanted to help each other out. So, you know, it, that was fine. As long as you have the right kind of friends, I don't think it's a problem. Um, so, no, not really. I mean, it is a little bit weird, you know, that if you bid on a job and your friend does and you get it and they don't, it's kind of like, you know, or vice versa. But you have to, you have to just really separate the business aspect from the friendship. Um, what is the worst camera lens uh, you ran into? <laughs> oh man, the worst? God, I don't know. I would say that I bought, I did a video on this lens. It's like, I don't even remember what it was called. This really terrible lens that they sent me to do a video on because people wanted me to do, everybody says, you use expensive stuff. And I mean, the lens arrived. It was like, had like oil leaking from it. It was pretty bad. But you know, what's interesting is in the end, it wasn't, I mean, it was a bad lens, but it was still kind of cool. It had its own features and stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have a problem. I didn't ever liked the original Fuji cameras that were Nikon bodies because they required two separate batteries. Those were a little weird, but they made great files. So I think everybody, everything has its place. Oh, you know what was weird? I don't know if they make it anymore. I wouldn't say worst. I'm just freaking out weird things. There's this camera. Maybe somebody will know what it's called. And the idea is that you just shoot and then in post you control what's in focus and what's not using like some kind of weird depth of field thing. I wouldn't say it's the worst camera, but it was just weird and it didn't really do what it said it did very well. So I would say that that's something I wouldn't buy personally, uh, but I don't know, worst. I mean, I've made pictures of all kinds of cameras. Um, I'll probably think of something I hated at one point. Um, let's see. I purchased a 23 inch touchscreen and added a small Windows computer the size of a cigarette pack. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Was it like a, like one of those uh, Raspberry Pi computers? That's pretty neat. I didn't know you could tether into stuff like that. Um, 
In your market, do you find other portrait photographers to be very nice people <laughs> and more of a collaborative environment than competitive? Seems to be the case here, and we're all friendly. Yeah, I do, actually. Uh, you know, you're always going to find somebody somewhere that's not friendly, I guess. Um, but hopefully they don't last long, because we, we, we make it as photographers as a community, you know? And I think that ultimately you want to be friendly with people. I'm sure that there are some people that are careful about their secrets and stuff like that, but that doesn't mean they're unfriendly, you know? And when you go to, if nobody's been to a convention, I mean, the world is opening back up, at least here in the U.S., hopefully conventions are going to come back. You'll find that photographers are great, you know? Most of us are, <laughs> of course, I did it right during the time people coming home, right? Uh, most of us are very friendly. Oh. Wow, that, that, I don't know. I mean, to me, like if I had a Jeep with those big old knobby tires for the winter, I'd probably change them by the time July came, but uh, I guess I like that noise. Um, yeah, no, I find the photographers are generally great. Every once in a while you run into one that's kind of a jerk, but for the most part, they're good. Uh, <clears throat> oh, how did you decide whether, you, how do you decide whether you're going to shoot with flash versus continuous? That's a very good question. Well, <laughs> on the most basic level, um, I decide how much uh, control I have, assuming you know, uh, how much control you have of the space. Like if I was going to make a portrait out here uh, on this porch, I would almost certainly use flash because the it's bright out here, relatively speaking, which means that with continuous lights, I'm going to have to use the daylight as part of my source. I don't have a choice. And even if that might be my idea, it might, I might change my mind, right? So flash will give me that control. If I'm somewhere where I know I'm in control, then I will go with constant lights if I want the certain feel the constant lights brings, which the, at least the constant lights that I use, that usually means I'm doing something with, with uh, color changing, you know, with the new uh, RGB gels, not gels, RGB W uh, LEDs, or I'm doing something very precise with my data lights. I actually really love using constant light. I mean, I have a daylight studio we very rarely do videos with the daylight because that would be just me saying, yeah, buy a studio on Manhattan and you can shoot like this. So that's why I don't do a lot of videos like that, but it's very nice to shoot with constant light. It really creates a different feel uh, and atmosphere. So I like it for a lot of my personal work. I also use it when I want something that's a little bit more what I call crunchy and grungy um, because I can really get the light tight, I feel like, and it still has a certain organic quality to it. Uh, maybe that's because I'm using data lights and they're so special, but typically if I'm making a general decision, I'm going to use constant lights if I have controlled space and I want that certain look, or more generally, if I'm shooting video as well, right? I'm going to use flash if I don't have control of the space and I want that control. So that's usually how I decide. Uh, oh, a bunch of stuff went by. Uh, let's see. Try not to miss things here. Uh, it's very hard to come up with the question that you haven't already answered. <laughs> yes, you're telling me. Um, yeah, thanks for all the help. Yeah, thanks, Isaac. Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes do things like I repeat things in videos because I feel like I either have a slightly different uh, approach to it, or you know, my opinions changed, or the world's changed. Uh, let's see. Uh, what am I going to shoot? A happy hour from the porch with the maybe when we can get people here again, you know, we'll uh, we'll do a happy hour. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, it was a while ago before I was doing a lot of videos. The very first time I ever did a live stream from the porch, which is maybe the only other time, I did it with Marissa, and it was it, thunderstorms came in and we lost power in the internet, and I was running it off my phone. That's out there somewhere. It's crazy. Uh, so that was kind of like happy hour. We had dinner anyways, at least before we shot. Uh, Anna, let's see. I just want to say, oh. I am the best. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that, Anna. Uh, does the inverse square law only apply to the camera sensor? Um, <laughs> that's a good question because you don't see it with your eyes. And, um, no. I mean, inverse square, and in fact, it doesn't even just appear, uh, apply to light. It's actually about lots of wavelengths and energy. Um, the reason why you don't see it so much with your eyes is that your brain reinterprets 
and your eyes have like a very good ability to kind of like uh, see into uh, the dark. Even though no matter how amazing the cameras are, your eyes definitely have a really wide range. And but your brain also interprets. Just like sometimes, like I'm, you know, you're, you're, like if you ever shoot video, like I do, you'll be in a space and you'll be shooting and you'll think it's super quiet and then you'll listen back to the video and you'll be like, oh man, I didn't hear all that noise because your brain is going to filter that out. Same thing with light. If I put a really bright light next to my face and I'm being filmed, you'll be like, wow, your face is so bright and that side's so dark. But if your eyes saw it, it would kind of equalize it. So yeah, it does actually apply. That's why it, it, you have to, it takes a while to train yourself. And, and I, I may have mentioned this before, but I was really a very, very heavy flash user. I still have a heavy flash user for a long time. And I uh, I remember there was a photographer, I can't remember his name, Ken something or other. He had this, uh, it was like kind of artsy, fashion y, erotica uh, kind of uh, blog. And he did this stuff, all this like really like contrasty black and white stuff. And I started talking to him online. And he was like, Yeah, I just shoot with natural light. And I'm looking at this and I'm just like, Huh? How do you do that with natural light? Because I didn't, my eyes didn't see. Um, that, right? He was also shooting film and blah, blah. But anyways, it was, this was a long time ago. So I actually made a point of trying to train myself to do it. So I was like, I'm not going to use flash and I'm just going to go out and shoot until I can get that skill. And so if you don't feel like you can see the, the, that that granularity, uh, I would just practice, you know, just mess around with it and you'll, you will see that the, that you're, you're, uh, you'll start to see the way the camera does, which is a weird thing to say, but like, you know, when you're looking at something, like I can look at something like I'm looking out here onto the porch and I, I can see my eyes clearly see a black camera in front of me, which is the darkest thing. I see the edge of the porch, which is like somewhere in the middle, and I can see the street that's getting some light. And I tell you right now, if I was shooting with the camera and I exposed for this camera, the, the black camera in front of me that I can see, that street would be absolutely blown out with no detail, you know, unless I went and post and brought it back down or whatever. But my eyes are switching back and forth. So, yeah. Uh, like, oh, God. I should talk less, though. I'm missing all things. Light oh, Lytro. Yes. Thank you, Seth. Yeah. That thing was so weird. I, I don't know. I never made it. The only way I ever got it to look like it was doing anything is if I put it super close to stuff. But anyways, that's... Because I also think the sensor was really tiny, so, like, the depth of field... Man, was, I'm not throwing shade. A little bit. Uh... <laughs> They try, uh, they tried kickstarting it. Best light modifier for specular highlights for fashion photography. Ooh, okay. So if you are shooting fashion, uh, and I'm assuming you mean clothes, uh, I would probably use something like a silvered uh, softbox, or uh, if you want specular highlights, silver so a silvered lined softbox with like a a quarter silk on the front. Um, or maybe a silvered umbrella with the very light, or a, a para. Those are all great for bringing out your spec specular highlights because um, they're punchy and silver, but they're large enough that you won't just get dots. Because remember, your specular highlight is the reflection of your source. So you don't want to use like a flashlight because that would be too hard, right? Um, magnums are amazing, um, but they're really for shaping shadow and stuff for me, so I wouldn't use that for the highlights. I'd use something large and silver, and that way you have poppy specular highlights, but they're not tiny, right? You don't want like your buttons or your sequins to have like a little dot on them. You want them to be encompassed and filled with light. I'm assuming you have sequins. Who doesn't have sequins? Um, all right, let's see. Tried kickstarting highlights. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I do use 300 pounds of constant lights. Oh my God. I've been a writer and a photographer. Photographers are way more competitive, uh, competent, way cooler. Not, not competitive, uh, way more competent, way cooler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Barbecue at my house, for sure. Wow, I wonder if the thunderstorm is going to come. You guys, I probably look the same to you because I have it on auto ISO. We'll see how that holds out. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to drink. Let's see. Uh, do you find that shooting, excuse me, for the same models, Improves your work. Three or four you like to shoot with when testing ideas, but I wonder if I should. Well, this is what I would say about that. Shooting different types of people is going to help improve your photography skills in general. If you're, you know, if you're beginning or you're somewhere in the middle, intermediate stages and you're trying to expand, 
Because you, what you don't want to happen is master shooting your friend Bob, and then you have to shoot somebody who's so different looking. So shooting a lot of people is gonna actually be good. Now that being said, if I'm testing something, it's nice for me to work with somebody I've worked with a lot because I kind of know the base result, right? If I'm gonna shoot like, let's say Marissa, right? I know what she generally photographs like. So if I'm changing up and trying new techniques, it's nice to use somebody you know. And also it's much faster. Like I had my friend Cadence come by yesterday. I'll throw some pictures up, I didn't shoot a video. Um, and we shot five outfits, it took us less than an hour. Different lighting in each one, very cool, very fun. And it's because we've worked together a million times and it was super fast. <laughs> the, the, the apples or whatever they were falling off the thing and hitting the roof. Uh, it's going to thunderstorm here. Oh, thanks, Al. Favorite scene to photograph in NYC? I love, I know it's cliche, but I love the cobblestone streets that you get in the meatpacking district. I have not been down there in a long time, but I love cobblestone. I think it's so cool. Um, so I would say in New York, I would go for cobblestones if I was trying to uh, shoot there. Uh, what are you going to do? One of those budget gear shootouts with Vanessa Joy. I am going to do that and just did it. And it was super fun. Vanessa's amazing. She totally won, but you know, what do you expect? Yes, that was what we were doing there. Uh, that was, uh, <laughs> it was really, really fun. I went down to, to, uh, I don't think I'm giving away too much to say this. Uh, we went down to Asbury Park, New Jersey. And I am a huge Springsteen fan, so it was awesome. I was driving around going, oh, oh, oh. So, but, you know, there we go. Uh, inverse square law works for the same way for radio. Yeah, exactly. Radio astronomy. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, it really does. It's actually, the inverse square is for, right, it's for um, wavelength. It's for waves, I think, right? So anything that travels in waves, so surfers. But boom, boom, come on. All right. <clears throat> Talk a bit, please, about the role of the client, the role of an ad agency and the role of the photographer in picking the model, props, clothes, etc. Okay. <clears throat> so, <laughs> right, you've got your, your client, right? You've got your ad agency. You usually have an art director, right? So that's, that's going to be your connector. Or possibly you might even have an art buyer, depending on how big the agency is. Then you've got the photographer, right? Um, depending on the situation, by the way, I'm close to the Hudson River. I don't know if I said that before, so I get these long freight trains that go by, and that's what you're hearing beeping. Um, I think we did a shoot once with, with Serena, and I had the trains in the background. Anyways, oh, jeez, <laughs> things are in the roof. <laughs> so it really depends on the size and scope of the project. Ideally, <laughs> you will have some say in the model as a photographer, but you may not because, for instance, if a, if a client uses, I don't know why this is on my head, but Lady Gaga as their uh, spokesperson for a certain product, and then you are hired to shoot that product, you don't get to choose the model because the model is going to be Lady Gaga, right? If you're shooting something that is more generic, uh, you should try to be involved is my advice because sometimes art buyers and art directors and clients and stuff may not fully comprehend how the model type might make a difference in a scene. Uh, and it really kind of, I'd say this mostly in smaller jobs, but usually you have a, an opinion, but you usually do not get to make the final choice. That's been my experience as a photographer. Very often they will choose the model that I think is best, but ultimately it is not up to me. You know, if you do an editorial, that's a whole different thing. Or if you're very famous or if they trust you after a while. Um, and also, in a lot of ways, you kind of don't want to pick the model, to be honest with you, because if the model is bad <laughs> and you insisted on that model, that's another responsibility. So don't put your neck out for a model unless you know they're good. That's my advice there. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, hold on. Uh, enroll a photographer in picking model. Okay. Props, clothes, etc. Now, that... The props and clothes and stuff, again, it depends on the size of the project, but a lot of times you will, as a photographer, be able to choose and hire a stylist, a both a set stylist and a fashion stylist. That will be your job or part of your job, can be part of your job anyways. 
and then you will um, in, interact with them, and then also they will interact with the with the art buyer or art director. So you're kind of again uh, directing, but you're not generally like picking the props. You're hiring the person that picks the props. Again, that's been my experience. Some jobs are different. Um, I mean, there's there's also client uh, type situations where the client is the art director, you know, and they might want to use. I one I shot this T-shirt uh, for this T-shirt company like. God, it was a while ago. And it was a, a gentleman that was running the t-shirt company with his, his partner was his significant other. And they hired me directly. We just talked back and forth what they wanted. He used, uh, he was one of the models, <laughs> a really good looking guy. And she was the other. So I had no choice. They want to use, they didn't have budget. You know, they want to use themselves. And when he was modeling, the, uh, the significant other was kind of with me working as the client. And when she was modeling, he was. So again, it goes all different levels. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for answering. One more question. For the running gun low light photographer, what flash modifier would you recommend uh, if there's no surfaces to bounce off of? Ooh. I mean, if you're taking the flash off the camera, hopefully, um, I would probably use some kind of small softbox uh, and hold it in your hand, you know, that, that's, or give it to an assistant. Uh, if it's on the camera, Something that bounces would probably be best, like a bounce card. Because unless they're really, really close to you, a different size, like a, a softbox is this big, is not going to be that different than a bounce card that's this big if they're six feet away from you, you know. So honestly, I'd go with a bounce card because generally that bounces the light around the space a little bit, even if there's no walls to work with. So some kind of bounce cardy thing, like, um, I don't know if they make them anymore, like the Gary Fong used to make or the... Uh, the, the pro photo makes that little bonnet thing for the, the A1. There's all kinds of stuff like that. But something that bounces and throws the light forward would be my first pick. Uh, or if you have it off the camera, some kind of like a small softbox. And I say softbox because if you, you know, you could just have a bare head or some kind of diffuser. But the thing is that if you're in a party or something, you might want to light this person and not the people behind. So again, you want to be able to direct it. And that's where a softbox is good for. Um, a lot of people for Fashion Week used to do these... Um, these like, I guess they were like a one and a half by two or one and a half by maybe 12 by 18 soft boxes. And they'd be on these like long arms with like a quick release and they'd have a wire. Of course, now you probably do it wireless and you'd be shooting with it like next to the camera if you, for the press stuff. And then if you want to do something more stylized, you would take it off and you know, and so that's probably what I would use. Uh, let's see. Sequins are so 80s. I love sequins. Unless they're out of focus. <laughs> then they're somehow current. <laughs> I love sequins. Uh, Pro 11 Pro Photo on location, any tips to power it? Ooh, for that size unit, you're probably going to want a generator. Make sure that the generator that specs, the Pro, I'm sure Pro Photo has this information uh, in their documentation of what kind of generator you can use. But for something that large, you're going to want a full-on generator, not a battery. And that'd be my my guess. Um, uh, I'll try it next time. Got some uh, good tulips to the fence. Oh, nice. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah, there you go. Um, am I going to see Springsteen on Broadway? I might, actually. I missed it the, the last time, but now he's back. I might just do it. I watched the special. I think it was on Netflix. It was very good. But yes, I am a big Springsteen fan. I go to the concerts and pump my, my fist. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. The answer you gave for the inverse square law question was the best. Oh, thanks. Huh. <laughs> He was expecting a light distance guide. Uh, okay, good. I'm glad that was that made sense. Let's see. I uh, recently found a roll of exposed Veracrome 120 that belonged to your father. It's been sitting since the 1950s, 60s. Do you know someone who specializes in developing such an old roll of film? Ooh. I mean, if it's Veracrome, so it's a, a slide film, I mean, it's going to suck because you'll lose shots, but if it was me... I would probably go to somebody local that does like a C41. You might have to go to the, like Manhattan because you're, 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 I'm assuming you're in the same Hudson Valley I am. Um, and I would do what's called a clip test where they just part, take part of the film and they develop it first just to make sure. Cause you're not going to know really, um, you know, how much to develop it cause it's so old. Um, so I probably wouldn't send it away if I could avoid it cause you're going to want that clip test. Uh, Degal, if they're still around, I send all my film out to the find lab and they do a great job, but again, I probably wouldn't send it out because you'd want to uh, you'd want to do this clip test and look at it. 
Um, by the way, uh, great guitar playing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're a musician as well. Oh, really? Wow, that's... Yes, Brian, John Prine is amazing. Um, 100 watching only 36 like. Oh, 100 watching only 36 like. Like this video, please. Thanks, Seth. Uh, I like the look you've managed with the big scrims. Yeah. Are they too big with the small? Hmm. With the ones I've mostly been using lately, the four footers, I would say no, they're not too big. In fact, you have a little bit of an advantage in a small space with the with them because you can butt them right up against the ceiling, so you won't get that. One problem I have in my studio is if I put it kind of where I want it sometimes, the light will go over it. <laughs> and I'll get, you know, it'll be hard to control it. So yeah, no, you can definitely use them in small spaces. Uh, put it right up against the ceiling and you're good. Just move your, you know, so if, I, if it's a four foot, let's say I have a nine foot ceiling, eight foot ceiling, you put it flat against the ceiling, you know, the light itself is not going to be that much higher than a standing subject. So what I would do is move the, the head that you're going to shoot through the light, move it towards the top of the, can you see my hand? Move it towards the top of the silk. So if your silk's here, move it towards the top and point it down. That way you'll still get the that that feel or you can even bounce it into the ceiling and have it come back depending on what your ceiling's made on uh i love silks that's one of my favorite ways to light so i don't always bust them out uh thanks Tom. oh kent miller uh that is also a very good uh uh suggestion thanks uh seth although it's chrome so but he might know somebody uh kent is uh I, so, I don't remember what this, Just look Kent Miller Photographer, you'll find him. He's on here. Send him a DM on, is he, is he yeah, he must be Kent Miller on Instagram. That's the best way to do it. Thank you. Uh, Veracro oh, Veracrome was black and white. Was it black and white? Oh, was it? Oh. Well, then it is not, everybody. <laughs> Clearly, I do not know my, oh, that's interesting. Why was it called Chrome? That's interesting. Usually, I guess uh, a lot of the, the the slide films were called Chrome, so that's always just my, my thought process. But anyways, if it's not a slide film and it's a, a black and white film, then yes, Kent Miller is probably the guy to talk to because he's all about the using the old, uh, expired, and weird uh, kind of uh, films. It's really cool. So check out his work. Oh, man, am I caught, all caught up? I guess I've been live for almost an hour. Any uh, other questions while we are here on the porch? It is getting dark. It has not rained yet, which is good. Yeah, it's black and white. Okay. So, yeah, do, do, reach out to Kent. He'll, he's super nice. Tell him Seth sent you. Ah. Paragon Pan. Okay. Can you see what I see from the porch? Yeah, I think I... Maybe. I don't know how I would do that. Oh, by spinning the camera? Uh, you would just see a pillar behind me. <laughs> I'll take a picture. Oh, not on my phone. I don't know how I could do that without turning the camera, which I don't really want to do because it's on a ball head. I'll do it at the end. But it just it's just a street <laughs> in the, from my front yard. It's not very exciting. Right now, it's just trees. In the winter, when the trees all lose their leaves, I see the pond that's across the street. Just trees. I guess if you live where there's no trees, then it's probably... A, uh, hold on. Let's say one has an original Canon 6D and a few great lenses and all. Well, should one generally avoid cats? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> yes. Uh, to me, uh, I only really buy a camera generally if I need it, which means it has some kind of function in it that I feel like is going to be good for me or something breaks or I need a second body or you know, this kind of thing. So I probably would say if your 60 is functional, then I don't see any reason to get a new camera. I don't remember if 60 had, yeah, it must have had video because five, all the 5Ds did. So I'm not sure what function you might want. Maybe it's like some of the tracking functions, but I'm not one to buy new cameras all the time. So uh, I would probably say, hold on to it. Uh, that's my personal opinion. Your fave DIY for photos. As far as piece of equipment? Mm. Well, that's a good question. I mean, the thing that I probably use the most and you see me use all the time is the Brooklyn Reflector. Um, 
I like to shape my light using a uh, foam board a lot. Like I make cookies out of them. Um, but I don't use a lot of DIY stuff as far as like, I don't even make my own snoots or anything. I've seen people do that and I've done it just for experiment, but it's not, you know, I feel like for me, the foam board is a good versatile thing. You can cut holes in it. You can reflect with it. You can use it as a tube to block light. So if you're only going to have one thing, that's probably what I would get. Uh, some foam board that's uh, silver, or you can paint it silver. Watch this video. Black, white, and then some A-clamps. And you can do so much. Um. <laughs> Am I near Millerton? I don't think so. I'm not originally from this area, so I don't know much else except what's right around me. Uh, I'm uh, off the Hudson River. I'm out there. Thanks, Seth. Thanks for hanging out. Are Colossal Beauty Dishes really the same as a rigid one? No, definitely not. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're not good. It just means they're not the same. Um, the, the thing about a beauty dish is that almost... So, I feel like I've said this before, but I'll say it again. There is one by Shamira, which I think I think they still make. It was the first one I've, I ever saw, by the way. And then everybody else started coming out with them. And when you open it up, it's only like this deep, which is like as deep as a beauty dish. Almost all the other ones are deeper and they're not quite shaped the same. So you don't get the real same feel for it. So I'm going to say they're not the same. Um, that being said, if you can't fit a beauty dish and you want something round with that kind of feel, it's not a bad light. But I definitely wouldn't pull it out and, and, you know, if I had a beauty dish, I wouldn't get it and go, no, I can just use this. It's not the same. It's a different modifier. Uh, well, thanks, Joshua. Uh, let's see. <laughs> use A73. That A73 looks pretty nice, though. Uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Sony's, like, base colors for their stills, so I don't use Sony's for stills, but... I had a couple of Sony uh, video cameras or cameras for video, and they were fine. Um, oh, in the live chat, you can't access. Oh, can't access the light. Oh, well, the like button. Okay. I didn't know. Uh, any plans for 4th of July? Yeah, so, you know, I am, as I mentioned, in the Hudson Valley uh, near West Point, and uh, we have great fireworks here. So I'm going to go for fireworks. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're back. I didn't check. But they're like a 10-minute drive from my house. Go down and see the fireworks. Relax. So, yes, it'll be nice. Um, I do enjoy a nice summer holiday when it's nice and warm and you can kind of go out. And finally, we're able to kind of get out and get closer to people and stuff. So, it's yes, it's good. Last year, oof. Um, let's see. Uh, it does have video, but only menu focus. Oh, okay. It doesn't have the... Uh, Oh, what do you call that? The Canon is that great autofocus for video. My video is stationary. Yeah. Bit it up the field. That's what I used to do with the Sony's, actually, because I didn't care for their autofocus. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Seth, for all the great instruction. Yeah, Seth, it's awesome. If you, if you happen to be watching this and you don't know who Seth is, which I would find very unusual, uh, you should definitely check out his channel. He's got a lot of great stuff over there. And, of course, he's on Adoram all the time. That's great. Uh, the Brooklyn Reflectors are awesome. Yeah, exactly. Uh, LOL about the DIY. Oh, I use foam board all the time. Yeah. No. I mean, so DIY is interesting because I've made a bunch of things over the course of my career when I needed something. But there's nothing, you, almost in every case, I made it for a project and then never used it again. You know, it was something for that project. Um, one of my favorite things I ever made, though, and I made it live at Adorama, although it was before we used to stream them, I did a um, inexpensive light. We were, we were trying to get more, I don't know, I wanted to get more video customers, so I was doing a video lighting demo of how to like do I DIY lighting. And I, and I using foam board and some, um, some sockets, I built this really cool softbox, and we lit up like a really dramatic scene with it. And, uh, and then when it was all done, I took, I, you know, I like unhooked it or whatever, and I gave it to somebody in the audience. But it was so fun. I mean, it created a beautiful, uh, creamy light because it was like these big boards. It was real deep, you know, because I took the big full boards and I put, uh, I think, six sockets in there with 100-watt bulbs and just put some diffusion on it. And we hung it up above. Oh, so nice. 
but I don't have it, so I can't say I really use it. Um, let's see. 42 inch glow beauty dish. I don't math well. Oh my God, that's huge. That's interesting. See, now, I've seen these bigger beauty dishes. Ellen Chrome has a pretty big one. And, oh my God. I can't think of the name of the company that has makes the giant beauty dishes that are the hard ones. I never found to me that they were beauty dishes for me. Because when I want a beauty dish, I want that look. So I'm not saying it's not a beauty dish, but to me, I want when I want a beauty dish, I want that size, that punchiness. So much larger would not necessarily be something I would look into. But I'd be curious. I'd let me know what you get with that. Because 42 inches, that could actually be, real, be really interesting if it's shallow enough that you could kind of create some real interesting stuff in a tight spot. I'd be curious about that. But 42 inches is pretty big, yeah. Uh, Portugal. Uh, thanks for your videos. Oh, cool. Uh, you and Seth painted a background on your live a while back. How come you guys never used it? <laughs> you know, I actually, there were a live demo. I, I could probably bust it out. I did make a video with it, but I didn't really like the results that I got with it, so... Not not that the background wasn't good, but just the the concept of the video, I didn't really care for it. You would probably be surprised to know that, maybe you're not surprised, that I probably make like at least one, if not two videos for, for Adorama for every one I put out. I just don't use them all. You know, I make them a bunch and then I, I see what I like best because sometimes you have an idea and you're like, this is a great video. And then you do something and it doesn't really make sense. So, uh, you know, I'd end up uh, tossing. Mola, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. And molas are beautiful. I'm not throwing shade, but to me, a giant mola is more equivalent to some kind of a, an interesting softbox than it is to uh, to a beauty dish. True. Yeah. Right. If you're going to go more full length, I guess you'd want that. But again, if you're going to back it up, although I guess with the big one, you could keep it close, like one of the very first things I said about keeping the light off the background. I guess a 44-inch beauty dish or 42-inch beauty dish would be great if you were shooting like a mid, like a, uh, you know, like the three-quarter shot and you wanted to keep the light real close to have it feel more like a beauty dish. So, yeah, that could be really interesting. I'm curious. Maybe I'll see if I can pick one up if they're not too expensive because I probably won't use it very often, so I'm probably not going <laughs> to. Molas are very expensive. And I only know one person ever that bought a big one and they bought it and they, they honestly said that they were happy with it. They didn't return it, but they were like, they probably didn't need to buy it because it wasn't that much different than other big things they had. Denver. Oh, nice. Oh, it's nice out there. So um, you're in Colorado. So close to Shamira. I don't know if it's close. Colorado is pretty big. Denver compared to, they are in, oh my God, I can't remember where they are. Well, I drove through Denver, like, maybe, like, six years ago. And, you know, it's, it's. I'm assuming it's, it must be eleva elevated, because it was nighttime, but I couldn't remember. I wasn't driving. My sister was driving. And we drove up, and, like, there's this big bridge. Tell me if I'm making this up, person from Denver. And then we were going across this bridge. It's beautiful. And then it started snowing, and I was like, wow. And it was, like, the spring. Well, the spring for us. It was beautiful. Yeah, Denver is a beautiful place. Um, are you inside? Small make fun bar. Any plans for live workshop this year? Maybe. I think now we're, we're starting to... Currently, the building is still kind of up in the air about, you know, bringing in, like, people um, in, in large quantities. Like, for my building, you still have to, like, sign to get in, and we can only have so many people in. So, you know, that's up in the air. As far as Adorama is concerned, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe. Thanks for all the videos. <laughs> use Seth's name every time you shop. That's fine. <laughs> you know, give Seth the credit. It's fine. Um, am I making any more videos with Marissa where she's learning? Yes. Marissa has been very busy, actually. she's Her, you know, acting uh, career is taking off. So hopefully we'll see her in a lot more stuff late, uh, coming out. And uh, she's not been around. But yes, when she comes back, um, we definitely will do that. And actually, we did another one where there was an audio screw up, and I think I might be able to recover it. So you might see one come out um, before then, but next time Marissa comes in, we plan on shooting, yes. Um, yeah, oh, it's very, yeah, it's very clean, yeah. Yeah, and the shadow, yeah, so I guess, yeah, it is, it is special. Every lighting modifier, 
practically is good in its own way, I guess is what I'd say. They all have a little bit of flavor. So that's why if you're, if you're, it's, you're able to rent things, it's a good idea to do so. Because you may or may not like it. Uh, let's see. Jazz concert. Any tips regarding aperture picture profile? Oh man, you're going to use... When you say record, are you saying like video record or record as in photos? Um, let me know because it'll, I mean, if you're shooting video, you should be able to just look. You know, I mean, you know, generally when you're shooting concerts and music and stuff, you've got to be willing to uh, do a lot of tests and really fast. So this is where digital cameras really help us because you're going to want to figure out the, the general lighting on the, the stage, which is going to be changing and kind of get yourself close there and then make quick adjustments. If you see things changing, usually I would do that to the shutter speed and just be wary. Well, nowadays I probably do it to the ISO when I used to shoot a lot of stuff, I was still shooting film. So I would do it to the shutter speed. I'd get a base aperture. I want to shoot at that. I felt comfortable like two eight or something. Because remember, 2.8 is only really, I mean, it's shallow, but it's only really shallow if you're super close to something. So if I'm standing back 10 feet and I'm shooting 2.8, that's a pretty deep, decent amount of depth of field for a single person. And you can uh, essentially get your basic exposure. And then when the lights go bright, you just kind of, you know, you got to get, it, it takes a little practice, but, you know, dial in, uh, dial your shutter a little darker and then dial it up if the, if the music, you know, if the, if the lights drop, you're going to have to be jumping back and forth, almost certainly, because usually music stuff does not have a fixed light. So, yeah, but I would find, I would probably lock in an aperture that I felt comfortable with and lock in a shutter speed that I felt comfortable hand holding. And then I would just bring my, just adjust my ISO up and down. I almost certainly would not put it in an auto though, because in a situation like that, it's going to have trick. It's going to be tricky to get the proper exposure. Um, and also if there's an opening act, shoot during the opening act. That's what I used to always do when I was shooting bands. You go for, you go early and you shoot the other bands before. So you get a general feel for the stage. But, you know, jazz, maybe they won't have that. Picture profile? I mean, again, if you're shooting stills, did you answer me? Oh, no, there you go. Okay. Video record. Okay. Uh, I would shoot... Okay. Hmm. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, you know, picture, per, keep in mind this, okay? So when you're choosing a picture profile, so I'll ask more, I'll answer more generically... Um, I mean, assuming you can't shoot log and have to, um, you have to consider your scene. So if I'm shooting something on a cloudy day in kind of a very flat scene, I might set my picture profile on standard or more vivid because I want to pump up the contrast because everything's so flat, right? Now, the other situation is now I'm in a nightclub, which is very dark and very contrasty. So you might think, oh, I'm probably going to want some kind of vivid profile because I wanted to see the colors and stuff. But remember that those profiles are going to add contrast. So I probably would go, I would err towards more of a neutral profile, um, making it, making the assumption that the extreme contrast of the club will make it look more like a standard profile. I mean, that's my, my general thought, but honestly, you're going to have to just do a quick test when you get there. But I probably would lean towards a uh, neutral for a picture profile. Uh, let's see. Yeah, underexposing is tough, but you know you want those blacks when you're in clubs. Uh, that reading the rest of your thing now. Uh, picked up for a hundred bucks. Parking lot sale. Sam's camera some years ago. It's not portable. Oh, oh, the oh, really? A hundred bucks for that Mola? That was yeah, that's okay. Uh. Do you active keep ratio between client shots, portrait, homework? Or do I go with the flow? Like a lighting ratio? Or a ratio of how much I do? Um, a lighting ratio? No. I mean, once I get the thing set up, I keep it the same. If you mean like um, mixing my work with the clients, I don't keep a ratio, but I do, like as far as like spreading my time out, I do try to keep uh, like a finger on my pulse, if you will, uh, because in fact, I was just having this conversation with my friend Cadence where I hadn't shot because it's been COVID, right? So the shoots I have been doing, I've been keeping limited. And so I've only been shooting for really videos and stuff. 
And I said, you know, I got to just shoot something because I, I knew my, in my gut I needed to just shoot. So yeah, it's a good up, it's a good idea to keep a balance, uh, if that's what you mean. You, well, how much of that? It really depends on your uh, yourself, really. Uh, any way to light up the look background and location with strobe? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Just use some kind of something with a radio trigger. I mean, that's one thing that uh, you'll see, like Joe McNally is, is kind of famous for using a lot of small speed lights. If you've got any extra small flashes with radios, they're great for that because you can like stash them in the background where they're unseen and still throw some light. Just when you're lighting a background for an environmental portrait, make sure that it makes sense, right? So if you have a lamp here, you know, next to me, throwing light here, don't put the light on the background on this side. That wouldn't make sense, right? You want to put it where the light is. So try to just make it make sense. Um, could you give me a hard time? Okay. Uh, should totally do some more videos with Marissa. Yeah, she is awesome. Uh, she liked one of your photos. Nice. Yes, Marissa is very sweet. Uh, video record. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Oh, you can shoot C-Log. Nice. Yeah, if you are not used to exposing in log, I would not shoot log. Because I made that mistake when I first switched to N-Log when I was shooting some videos. Because you can't, you're looking at it, it always looks like it's fine because it all just looks flat. And then I realized I completely underexposed. So I, unless you're used to log, I would not shoot log, to be honest. I would shoot a more, I would just shoot a neutral profile. A decent monitor, that would also help. Um, most of embarrassing client issue mm. mine just happened where it was apparently cold and the mom and the family shot asked me to remove a certain items in post-processing <laughs> yeah well yeah you know you become like i mean luckily for me i guess i went to art school and we had to draw and paint and photograph uh, nude figures. So I became very comfortable with saying things. And I think that's kind of, it's, it, it's, it's tricky and you got to be very careful to say it in a way that is not going to come off as creepy. If you see something like, you know, like it's cold and you see, you know, nipples or something. Um, you know, I would, I wouldn't yell it out, <laughs> you know, generally speaking, uh, I would pull them to the side and say, you know, this is what's happening and uh, don't be embarrassed by it, but just understand that maybe you can do something about it if they can wear a jacket over it or whatever. Um, but if it's in post and they ask for it to be removed, then that's that's fine. Um, I did have, which is kind of similar and kind of a, a funny story. I was shooting this and it was one of the first kind of bigger jobs I did. It was going to be a billboard and they just wanted a really simple shot. And I'm, these days they probably use stock for it. It was literally just a female and she was uh, just wearing a tank top with their logo on it. And she was like, I can't remember what she was doing. She was like, for some reason, she had her arms up. Maybe she was clapping or something. And going back to an earlier thing, they insisted on a model. They did, I did not book the model. They brought a model in. Well, turns out that they had found her at some bikini contest or something. That's the kind of thing that she did. This was in Miami. And she had been out all night. She didn't uh, use the proper uh, cleaning for her armpits. She didn't shave her armpits. So now she shows up. We're making a billboard and she raises her armpits and she's got hairy armpits, right? So I saw it. And of course the clients being dudes and not being comfortable, um, didn't like react at all. And I said, and I went to him, I said, do you realize that that's going to show up? <laughs> and of course they always say what clients say, oh, will that be obvious? Yeah, it will. So I ended up going to the makeup artist because I felt that was most appropriate. And I said, you know, you're going to have to say something to this model. And then I sent my assistant down to the drugstore to buy, you know, I asked her what kind she would want, the appropriate, you know, cream and razor to shave it. And then we did it. So, yeah, you just got to, just got to handle it. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, listen, I, I live my whole life with my mom who's super embarrassing, so I can always be embarrassed. No, I'm just kidding, mom. Um, <clears throat> uh, did you ever use Apple Aperture? I did not use Apple Aperture. And I didn't use it the second time you typed it either. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It showed up twice. Uh, you just, uh, Joe just 
Joe described you and him as the two old uh, puppets on the balcony from the Muppets. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Is it wrong that you're laughing? <laughs> no. Uh, totally missed not having it. Yeah, it looked really cool. Um, at the time when that was kind of the software, uh, I was shooting exclusively film. I had gone... I was a super early adopter. Wow, it's very dark. This camera's doing a good job. It's on auto ISO. Um, oh, that's the, the the chair right here is throwing a shadow. I'm like, look, there's a pattern on the wall. Um, I had gone digital early. Like, I was the second person in Miami to have a digital camera besides the news agencies. And it was... It was we used to... I don't want to get into... I'm an old man. But anyways, I had it. And then... Right around the time that Aperture came out was when I kind of was moving to New York. And I came to New York and I went back to shooting film. And I shot film for a long time again before I went back to digital. So uh, during that period, that's when App Apple kind of had Aperture and it grew. And when I came back to digital, <clears throat> I was shooting, I used Lightroom just because I got a copy of it from a friend who gave it to me and to try. I was using a studio, basically. And uh, <clears throat> I really like Lightroom, so I just stuck with it. Back then, um, Capture One only worked with the digital backs as well. Like, you could look at JPEGs and stuff in it, but, like, you couldn't put, like, a Nikon RAW file in it. It wouldn't open it. It only dealt with, at least the version I had, uh, Capture One Pro, only opened digital, uh, the, the, the Phase One digital back files. Oh, all right. Wow, can you hear that? The air conditioner just came on. Yeah, I can see it on the thing. <laughs> All right, guys. I think I'm going to wrap up here. The air conditioner came on, which means my house is getting hot. Any uh, final questions, thoughts, concerns? I'll, uh, I've got a few more of these Fridays videos. I recorded them. I just, I, you know, I wanted to do this one here. And we'll see what the summer holds. You know, I, I, I like that delivery. So I hope you guys are liking that. Seems like you are. Uh, shorter videos, tidbits. So if you have questions, you know, that... Uh, besides what we talked about here or even to expand on you know let me know because that's just a great way for me to be able to kind of put out the content that you guys want um i'm trying to stay away from doing um here's the new camera you know because you can see those on uh, places like adorama so I, I like doing this these kind of five minute videos that cover little topics so it could be business it could be technical you know whatever you have a question about uh photography wise and uh yeah i really appreciate like all the support here on the channel i, I you know it's great to know you're out there doing your thing. I don't think I'll go back, somebody said earlier, to doing it every day like I did at the beginning of COVID. I don't really have time to do that. Um, and I'm also in a different mindset. I mean, at the beginning of COVID, when we were all like trapped in our homes here, it was really good for me mentally to be able to talk to you guys every day. So it helped me a lot. So I really appreciate that. Um, but now, you know, world's opening back up. I'm, I'm out more. So hopefully we'll get some, some more videos with Marissa soon. If you want to see more demo type videos on this channel, I can maybe make some. I figure that's what Adoram is for, so hopefully you're following them uh, because that's <laughs> that's good for me. If you watch the videos on Adorama, then they know that people like my videos and they will continue to have me, which I appreciate. Um, and uh, yeah. Summer vacation or keep shooting? My whole life's a vacation. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm going to travel a little bit in the summer, but I'll, I'll be around. You know, I... I I remember that like early on in life, very early on in life, you know, I had like a regular job when I first got out of college and I had like four weeks vacation and I thought that was a lot. But then I realized that once I was a photographer that while I never get a vacation, I kind of always do, right? I'm always doing what I love to do. I can always travel. I can move around. So you may see me in different areas, but just a straight up no work vacation. I don't think I'll be doing that maybe in the fall. I really enjoy the fall, you know. I was trying to do a road trip with Marissa, but then, you know, uh, we have to get our schedules in line. So you may see that uh, a road trip series. So we may come to a town near you uh, in the U.S. Sorry, guys. Uh, hopefully in 2022, I'm planning on going uh, to the U.K. and uh, and also the, the, Europe, the European Europe proper, I guess you would call it. I don't know, the continent of Europe, is that how you say it? Um, so... Yeah, I can definitely do more of these. Uh, maybe I'll try to do one every, you know, six weeks or so. Um, 
Well, you are welcome. I appreciate all the things, guys. I, like I said, I, I <laughs> it, this is a very positive space for me. So I really enjoy doing these videos for you. Um, I hope you learned something from them, but it also gives me a chance to kind of just put things out there into the world that I think are positive because, you know, I think we all need to do that. Oh, the rain's coming. I love the rain. There's nothing like sitting on the porch. I don't know if you guys can hear it. You probably can't hear it because the air conditioners. Uh, but nothing like sitting on the porch when it's raining with a, well, now cold cup of coffee. <laughs> um, so I'm going to enjoy the rain. Yeah, I will. I'm going to travel around. When I will let you know, uh, you know, on social and stuff and to various places when I start traveling because I will appear in different places. And if people are around and they want to meet up, I uh, will definitely do that. Oh, man, yes. I would love to see Gavin. Gavin's amazing. If he will have me, which he will, because Gavin's awesome. Um, Finger Lakes. Okay. Does that... Hold on. Finger Lakes. That sounds familiar. Is that in, uh, in northern... Is that in New York? Why does that sound familiar? I would Google it, but I'm doing the computer. So I'll, I'll look it up. That sounds super familiar. Rain shoot. Oh, man. So beautiful. All right, guys. I will see you later. Be safe. If you're celebrating the holiday, uh, be extra safe. Uh, if you're not, um, then just enjoy a great... Uh, yeah, upstate New York. Perfect. So I will check out Finger Lakes. Have a great weekend, you know, and uh, in a great week. And I will see you next Friday, probably with a pre-recorded video. And uh, yeah, turn the oh right, turn the camera. Well, now it's dark. Let me see if I can do this without killing myself. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to a break screen for one second, but I'll be right back. All right, that's basically looking, <laughs> that's looking down. Let me see. Oh, hold on, I'll wide, wide launch. And let me see, this is not a proper video camera, so I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna lift it up. Yeah, that's basically the, you see my stairs down there? And there's the electricity. So in the winter, that you can, you'd see the pond that's across the street, but unfortunately, it is not the winter, so you are just seeing trees. Right across there is actually part of the Appalachian Trail. So if you are ever on the Appalachian Trail, you might walk right past, right past my house. So at, with that view of the street, I'm going to let you guys go. Oh, oh, Shamir in Colorado. They are the inventor of the softbox. And they are a, a U.S. company. They're in Boulder. Oh, I would love to go to Scotland. All right, guys. See you later.